Welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined by the head basketball coach, Mike Bray. Coach, a one in one week. You had a tough one down there at Wake Forest. Really talented team you took on, and you lost to them close late, but you bounced back nicely with the win against Syracuse at home on Wednesday night. What was your takeaway from the week? Well, that's our personality. You know, we lost to a very good Wake Forest team in a really heck of a basketball atmosphere. We had our chances, couldn't finish, but this group has shown after a loss, they bounce right back and an offensive struggle, uh, not much defense against Syracuse, but we uh, we earned the win, our 13th league win and our 20th win of the season. I'm very proud of our group. You mentioned the ability to bounce back. You mentioned that after a loss, every game since uh, Boston College that you've lost, you guys have not just won, you've won at least four in a row. What does that tell you about this group that they've been able to move past these losses and then start big streaks? I really put that on our leadership. You know, we talked about streaks after losses. And you know, when you talk about it as leader, as the coach, you know, there's some wishful thinking there. Will they really buy into that? And I think Apprentice Hub, a Nate Lashevsky, a Dane Goodwin, a Cormac Ryan, our captains have really sold that message. We're gonna bounce back and we're not gonna just bounce back with one. Coach, appreciate it. When we come back, we'll break down both the Wake Forest and Syracuse games. This is the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. It's now time for this week's game breakdown as we look at the Wake Forest game. Coach, going into this one, there were five games left in the regular season. You're right there with Duke trying to hold serve. You guys were really vocal, too, about let's lean into this thing. Let's try to win this ACC regular season title. And you wanted to put some pressure on them with this game starting before Duke. So what was the mindset and message going into Winston-Salem? No question. I think our guys have really grasped this chase of the regular season title. And I said, we get to play first. And we could put pressure on them. And we get off to a great start, Tony. I mean, we're really ready to play great basketball atmosphere on Tobacco Road against the most improved team in the league that's really playing well and all of a sudden is really old by way of the transfer uh, portal but uh, really good offensively we're scoring we just we really had a hard time guarding them not only in the first half but pretty much the whole game yeah they got some great scores of course Alondis Williams leading the conference in scoring I do want to ask about that start as you mentioned after the first media timeout they were up briefly 12 to 6 and then you guys really figured it out you hit him with a big run 18 to 4 run and at one point five different guys made a three-pointer to me that's when you guys are at your best when you never know where the shot's going to come from what did you see in that run well, we were really sharing the ball. There's no question about it. I think Blake Wesley, again, on the road, kind of jump-started a little uh, from us from the three-point line, and then everybody got involved. You know, we got out in transition. Um, we made the extra pass. It's a, uh, it's a fun team to watch play when they're making the extra pass. Let's talk about Blake. He had 15 points in the first half, four threes. To me, it looked a lot like Clemson just the week before. On the road, he seems to be just an even more dynamic player. He also had three steals in the first half. What have you seen from Blake, especially in these big, hostile road environments? Well, remember about three weeks ago, everybody had him hitting the wall. And, and uh, you know, the kid physically is a beautiful athlete and He's got great older teammates that have helped him. Blake Wesley has just become a better all-round guard. His decision-making with shot selection, his decision-making when to drive, when to pass, when to finish, uh, it's, it's been very exciting for me to see him just digest being an all-round guard and being under control and making more efficient decisions offensively. I think something your team has done a really good job of this year is finishing first halves. In this Wake Forest game, though, it was one of the few times where I think the opponent had the edge. You guys were up 41 to 29, a 12 point lead, and in the final three minutes, they ended on just a mini 6 0 run, but I felt that really gave them some belief going into halftime. What did you take away from that three minute stretch, and then what were you guys talking about in the locker room? Yeah, there's no question. They really, their defense got better, you know, and more physical the last couple minutes of the half. Um, you go in at halftime, and even though they made the run and have momentum, you're looking and saying, all right, we got 41 on the board, and I thought for us to win, we were going to have to get into the 80s, maybe 85, because you're just not going to stop them. We're going to have to outscore them a little bit. So you felt pretty good, you know, going into the second half because we were in scoring mode. 
they came out in the second half really quickly, got it to like a two-point game. And you know at this point you're in a game like you said. But I thought your team did a great job. At that point, for the next 10 or 15 minutes of the second half, it was really punch, counterpunch, an offensive exhibition. What would you like from your team? They, they never let the game get away from them in that run in the second half. You know, Tony, this group has been really poised. And they really believe. And on the road, they do not get flustered in tough atmospheres. And they just play through stuff with a mental toughness and a physical toughness. And even in the midst of a run of another team, when we're on their court, they kind of believe we're still going to have a chance. And we did. Nate Lasheski hit a big three with about four minutes left that gave you the lead. I just want to talk about Nate because he went down with that lower leg injury about two and a half weeks ago at NC State. It took him a while to adjust to the knee brace, but man, since he's kind of gotten his legs under him, he's really found his rhythm and he's knocking down a lot of big shots for you too. A lot of respect for him playing, you know, not completely healthy. How about the charge? He took a, he got hurt taking a charge two weeks ago. The second charge he took against Wake Forest the guy just ran over him, and he's right there and gives himself up. Um, but you, you're right. I mean, he and he has the the knack of making big threes for us. That has really been kind of the mo on him now for a couple years. But just love how he's playing, and we're getting him healthier. And we need him healthy for March. I want to talk about late game here because, again, your team, I thought, just they do a great job keeping games close. Even the games that you've lost, I feel like they always give you a chance. Cormac Ryan hit a couple big free throws to make it 72 to 70. Then you guys defend really well, but Musius knocks in that big three. But you respond right away. And I want to talk that, about that possession. Down five, you did not hesitate. Blake Wesley came down and got Cormac a great look from the corner that got you guys back within two with a minute left. What'd you like about your team's execution late? Well, it was the one time we tried to double the post a little bit and they kicked it out put it in rotation and they hit a three you know because they were killing us inside we tried something different they took advantage of it uh, and that's really kind of the fearlessness and swagger this group has we come right back down Blake finds him and Cormac rises up and drills it mm -hmm. to kind of answer back and it's really the M.O. of this group, man. I, I think they just love close games in road atmospheres. They're addicted to it. You came in, called the timeout. They come down, they get a couple free throws, I believe, to make it a four-point game. Again, I thought Blake, I mean, this is really telling at this point in the year, down the stretch, he takes the ball, goes right to the rim, not scared to go to the free throw line. I want to ask you here, though. He makes the first. If he were to make the second and make it a two-point game, do you think about playing the foul game then, or are you going to play that out no matter what with about a 13-second differential? I, I think what, what we've liked to kind of play that out when it's a one-possession game, you know, you, it, whether it's obviously three or two or one or two or three. We, we, we almost feel we want to play that out and, and just not get into the foul and, uh, and – you know, we, we did get the stop, and we get the look on the baseline probably to get it to overtime. Cormac had just hit one in the, follow, in, the, in the far corner, and, you know, you just you live with that. We got a clean look. I thought Blake again got in there. We didn't want to call timeout. We wanted to think in chaos better than our opponent, and I thought we did. I, I, I'm always curious about what the message is after a game like this because you said, and you just talked about the last couple of possessions, your team could not have executed offensively trailing in a tough environment. As, as you said, you got a great shooter who's shooting about 50% in his last four games from three in Cormac, a look that just goes in and out. When you talk to a team after a game like that, you know they wanted, they wanted to stay tight with Duke and it doesn't go their way, but you're happy with the execution. What do you tell them? You know, really kind of bounce back mode. And, and, and you know, before I get into the locker room now, our captains and especially Hub set a tone like, fellas, we emptied the tank. Mm -hmm. We gave ourselves every opportunity. Um, let's go back and get some rest tomorrow. And, you know, and I, I told him, I said, when we've lost the game, we've had a six game, a five game and a four game win streak. Let's start another one on Wednesday. Coach, appreciate it. When we come back, we'll talk about how the Irish bounce back against Syracuse on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. It's now time to continue this week's game breakdown as we look at the Syracuse game. Coach, you talked about it at the end of the last segment. We've talked about it throughout the show. Your team's ability to bounce back this year has just been outstanding. But you, you can't take it for granted, right? Just because you lost doesn't mean you're going to bounce back. You have to do the work. What would you guys focus on to get ready for Syracuse, which is always a unique matchup? Well, you know, can you really chase them off the three-point line? You know, can they not make double-digit threes? Uh, I know they were going to score. They're a gifted offensive team. But can you limit the three-point shots? 
And the games with Syracuse lately have been beautiful to watch because the ball's going in the basket on both ends. And neither team can really guard the other. We did a little better job guarding the three-point line than they did, and we escaped. I want to ask about the zone just because it's famous. I mean, everyone knows about it, and, and you get to see it now more being uh, playing against Syracuse so often. So when you get ready for it, what do you focus on? And then I just thought, you know, it, it looked like it took three or four possessions, even if you've been preparing for it all week, to get used to, okay, they really do come out and defend it like this. So as a coach, how do you prepare for that patented 2-3 zone? The biggest thing is to not overcoach it mm -hmm. and, and get guys in an attack frame of mind, understanding they're going to have to make some passes and pass fakes and slow down a little bit. But when you have an open look, fearlessly step up and take it. And, and you know, through the years, I've liked our program against zone because we have a good passing team and usually always a good shooting team. Certainly the Paul Atkinson middle of the zone guy was special, you know, the other night. Uh, but I thought Hub quarterbacked us from up top brilliantly, just moving us around to different places. And we made 11 threes. We have 19 assists, only seven turnovers. That's pretty efficient. We'll talk about Prentice in the second half. Let's talk about Paul in the first half. A double-double in the first 20 minutes. He went for 14 points, 11 rebounds. I know you thought he was going to have a good game, but did you think it was going to be that dominant in the first half? I, I didn't know he could do that. I thought we could really take advantage of him. We were able to throw it to him and post him up more than I thought against their zone. I told him to be mentally ready to just get to the offensive board, which he did. Um, but I thought our guys really looked to move the zone enough and feed him just like we feed him versus man-to-man. -man. It almost became man-to-man -man when we fed him and then we played basketball. And him one-on-one, -on -one, I like him against anybody. Nate Leshesky also knocked down three first-half threes. Had another great game for you. We talked about him in Wake Forest. Just continues to kind of get better as he comes back from that injury. What did you see from him? It seems like, again, he just let the game come to him. They were all threes in the offense. Well, the knee's feeling better. Then he gets a stomach virus and doesn't <laughs> practice Monday and Tuesday and maybe warms up a little bit at the shoot-around. And he's a veteran and a tough guy. Come, I thought he's always been a weapon against zone where he can just get his feet set and shoot it. And again, our good passers did a great job of finding him after distorting the zone. At halftime, it was 42 to 38. The Bayheims had 28 of their 38. They were really fun to watch, quite frankly. Nobody led for more th by more than four points in the first half. So it was a really close, competitive game, so fun to watch. What were you guys talking about in the locker room at halftime? You know, I, I thought we could jack up our defense a little bit more and whoever was guarding their big, Paul or Nate, to help on one of the Bayheims as they started to move because they back you down and play a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And we did a better job in the second half. We had no kills, three stops in a row. In the first half, we had four in the second half. Our defense upped itself a little bit. So you come out of the locker room, you make a quick three from Dane Goodwin. It looks like, okay, you're gonna extend this thing you had it to seven. They hit you with a quick 9-0 run to take a two-point lead. I thought your team responded so well out of that timeout. It's a 13-0 run. All the points scored by Leshesky and Cormac Ryan, who matched the season high with 16 points. What impressed you about that? You know, it, it's almost part of the fabric of this group now, coming out of a timeout in the second half and getting on a run. And I, I'm really pleased with how Cormac is playing. He's been that defensive stalwart for us all year. But now his offensive game has calmed down. He's seeing things. The game has slowed down for him. He's shooting the ball for us and just being an amazing all-round guard. When he's shooting the ball well, I mean, we've talked about it throughout the year, but he's scored four, or he's been in double figures four consecutive games. I feel like if he's in double figures, you guys are really tough to beat. Do you think that if he keeps this up, you guys even have a higher ceiling? It's funny how things happen. You know, a Leshevsky injury gets him into the starting lineup, which ups his confidence and makes him feel better. And you're right, I mean, I, I love him scoring double figures for us. If we can keep scoring up in the 75 and 80s and 82, we're gonna be tough, tough to beat. Syracuse, to their credit, I thought did a really good job fighting. They didn't let this thing get folded up. It was a 12-point game. They trim it all the way down to two, 65-63, four minutes left. It feels like every week we sit down in these chairs, and I say, okay, final media timeout or something you had to call late in the game. It's a one-possession game. What was the discussion like? And then we'll talk about the Prentice. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I called timeout because, you know, I called timeout because I thought Prentice in our group, but especially Prentice, was exhausted. Hmm. You know, I looked down, he's bent over. Now, he was picking up 
and zigzagging a ball handler. I really couldn't afford to take him out of the game because he was, and he was tired. Mm -hmm. And so I said, this is more of let's just get a rest because mm -hmm. certainly that's not what I drew up in the, uh, in, the, in the timeout and not that you draw things up against the zone. We had a little ball screen entry set. They did a good job guarding it. Now all of a sudden we got shot clock pressure on us. But when the man launches an incredibly difficult shot, it's in the air forever. And I'm thinking to myself, Hub's a winner, and this is his year. I think that one may go, and darn if it didn't. The guy, the guy when it's on the line, you know, through his career, but especially this year, he, he's always delivered, even with hard shots. It's unbelievable because that's a shot, I'm convinced, if he takes that four minutes into the game in the first half, it might miss the rim. Yeah, it's an air ball. But, but four ball. minutes left in the yeah, game, no. it's straight through. Yeah. It's unbelievable what he's done this that's year. That's where I've had to get uh, my new assistants who came in and, 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 and they went, ah, you know, hub and this. I said, just wait till the last four minutes. That crazy one right there, it may go in. He's going to get fouled. He'll bank it in. He, he is a fearless, uh, short memory guy, and he's caused me to have a very short memory. He could throw one in the pep, pep band. He could shoot an air ball. And then the last three minutes, he's going to make every free throw. He's going to make a right decision, and you just... He's fearless, I love him, he gives us all confidence. Let's talk about one more thing you did, and that was hit a career high in assists with 10. You said he quarterbacked against the zone. You need that person to identify, even if it's not creating the, the true assist, it might be a hockey assist, or just getting you in the right stuff. What'd you see from him, not just the shot making, but the leadership and distribution that allowed you guys to have 19 assists as a team? We made sure we kept him at, t at the top, on the point of the zone, and I think it helped Blake Wesley to play, that's the first time Blake's played against that zone. And I thought he was very solid and under control, but probably because he had Prentice Hub up there touching the ball every other pass. And I want him getting it, boom. You know, he just, he just calmed us. And he touched it just about every other pass. And you're right, if he didn't have the assist pass, it was the hockey assist pass. And then, you know, he, and he knows he's not gonna get many shots mm -hmm. against the zone, but he's secure enough to know, I gotta defend, and I'm just gonna stir the drink offensively. And that, that's a veteran guard. I, I've not had a guard quarterback against Syracuse's zone like him. We've had some good nights, don't get me wrong, through the years. That was a clinic on quarterback and against the zone. He was four points and three rebounds shy of a triple-double, which is pretty impressive. I wanna talk about Blake, who you mentioned, just because he made two really big free throws for you late. We talked about at Winston-Salem, he split a pair. He's had to shoot a lot of clutch free throws for you guys this year. I get the sense, and the numbers might not reflect it in true percentage, but man, late in game, he yeah. seems really comfortable going to the line. He's willing to go to the rim. He's not scared to get fouled and be in those pressure situations. I, I think we have two guys like that now, Hub and him. Blake is fearless, you're right. He's gone to the line and his percentage on, you know, game pressure free throws has gotta be really high. Mm -hmm. But he also wants the ball, and we talked to him by not settling for threes against the zone. Drive the closeouts. Coach Humphrey was on him the whole second half. Don't settle. And he got in there a couple times, got fouled, and made some great passes. Paul Atkinson Jr. got a big rebound late, knocked down a couple of free throws. I was excited to see him get to that 20-point mark. Career high, 17 rebounds. Career high, eight offensive rebounds. Just to see him have the performance he had. Uh, you know, when he came to this team, there were, I think people rightfully so were like, is the Ivy League stuff going to translate to this level? It has exceeded at least my expectations. To see him have the game he had against a high-profile team like Syracuse, what'd that mean to you? I think he's um, really adjusted to the bodies and the athletic ability that he's had to play at this level. And it's been a process, and I think he's really understood how he's got to bring it. Again, he plays with really good teammates who are great passers, but he's got a great edge about him. He's in the best physical shape of his life, and right now he's really confident. The win gets you to 13-4 and four in the conference. You hold serve with Duke. They beat Virginia, so you're still one back with three to play. But I want to ask you more importantly about 20 wins. There was a great clip of you in the locker room talking about 20 wins. When you get to 20, no matter how you get there, that's a big deal. What did it mean to you and this team to get to 20 wins on the season? I think 20 wins is, <clears throat> is still a great endorsement of a group if you can get to 20. I know we play more games now than we did 20 years ago or 25 years ago, but you get to 2-0 you know, you, you've done something. You're, you're, a, you're a heck of a team to do something. And to get to 13 league wins, you know, with, with a couple more to go is very powerful. So I want them to take some breaks along the way and go, 
man, we've been chasing this. We hit a mark. Now let's get back to chasing a regular season title in practice. One more thing to ask you about. You guys are now 12 and one at home. The only loss came to Duke. Otherwise, you guys have been just fabulous on your home court. You've got a couple more, but how important is it to this team to finish this season 14 and one at home? No, it's been, it, it, we're a confident group in this building. And I, and I really give a lot of credit to our fans. Mm -hmm. We've had good energy in the building. Our legion, our student section has been just off the charts and has really made us believe, especially in the second half when we're playing defense in front of them and they're loud. So uh, I, I think, our, you know, and I'm, I'm happy for our fans. I think they've really enjoyed this team that has grown together, that had to go through tough stretches, not only this year, but through their career. Um, and has really blossomed into a group that plays the right way. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. It's now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel where we go inside the play. Coach, this is against Syracuse. You always have to move the ball quickly against the zone. This, I thought, was one of the most impressive trips by your team offensively. Just talk me through everything that happens on this trip. Well, this is the kind of stuff that a coach loves to see. <laughs> You know, the ball not sticking, the unselfishness where everyone's touching it, swing it, probe, hit, you know, we just, we understand the shot clock, plenty of time, patience, different guys get to the foul line, you know, we just continually move it. And after movement like that, when a shot goes up, I always think it's going in. You're always, the basketball gods reward you. It's going in when you move it like that. I thought what was impressive here, too, is the ball was never dribbled by an individual mm -hmm. player more than once. It was just an escape dribble to move it. I mean, it, it was just a clinic, I thought, in ball move. This, you know, we have a team, I, I, I tell them, I think we're the best passing team in America. Hmm. And, you know, uh, they love to pass. They, they're willing passers. They're unselfish. They know who they're playing with. And it's just, you know, for Prentice's movement there, foul line, step out, Blake slides over, we've got spacing here, and you just feel good about it. You're rewarded when you move the ball like that. All right, coach, more great ball movement. This is the final basket of the first half against Syracuse. A little bit different the way the ball moves around, but again, it doesn't stick and your team gets a great three. When I go to a coaching clinic this spring, this is the clip versus zone. Here's how you attack a zone. But what poise again, the ball not stick. And it starts with Hub moving guys around and kind of being the quarterback there. You know, we get a foul line touch, which is always good. Paul doesn't force it. And how about Cormac's poise here? Get to the lane, two feet, kick it out. Again, you're rewarded. Those shots always go in when you move it the right way. But this is a heck of a play. Paul's such a great passer. He gets caught down here in a double team but is able to see it and make a heck of a pass out. You know, Prentice with another one, touch pass. Here comes Cormac, shot fake, close out, keep the dribble alive, get to the paint, still get off two feet. That's where he's gotten calmer and deliver it to Nate in the side gap. Just, just beautiful basketball. I mean, again, as a coach, when your team shares it like that, it's one of my best feelings. It moves me, Tony. <laughs> it moves me. <laughs> okay, coach, this is second half. This is an example of your defense leading to offense. Sometimes the best way to beat a zone is just to beat it down the floor. But talk me through the defensive side of this possession first. Well, I thought our defense really picked up here, Tony. Watch Nate Lashevsky and Blake switch this. All right, Bayheim goes under and then uses the screen again. We're very aware of him. And so we just switch it, you know, and Blake ends up on a big. They try to take advantage, but you forget Blake Wesley's got a wingspan of about seven feet, makes a play. And I love this early. What a great pass by Prentice. And Nate Sensen, that's kind of a dagger one right there. Just great here, awareness of Bayheim, And on the lob, Cormac's making a play on the ball too, but Blake to make that play. It started with the switch. They force a pass. And uh, Blake, when he's active back there and rebounding in the paint, which we've stayed after him about, it helps our defense. This is another assist by Prentice and coming down the floor and getting something great and feeling it. Just on the defensive side to follow up, this feels like a play that your team this year, they've just committed to defense. That's yeah. the kind of switch communication that maybe wasn't happening a year ago. This year, I mean, that's a great example of them locking in on the defensive end and they get rewarded with a cheap three points for it. No question, great strides on this end of the floor. The communication, and, and it's a young guy involved. Mm -hmm. Blake couldn't do this and talk this out, you know, in December. Mm -hmm. And then Nate is a veteran and we're aware of Bayheim. We can't give up a three. Now, Nate trips and falls down, but Blake is, we call that whiting it, full front, mm. whiting the post, full front, 
and go up and make a play on the ball and it leads to transition. Great communication. Our student body right here, their voices behind us give us confidence too in the second half. That does it for this week's edition of Irish Intel. When we come back, we'll have Irishography on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. So Trey, the team's playing really well right now. You guys are second in the conference. What's been working? Uh, I think it's just a mixture of our defensive stuff and uh, the offensive stuff from practice that we carry over. And the uh, guys are figured out through the, the year uh, how to play with each other and we start to learn how to play off each other. And uh, that chemistry as well as what we practice every day, our principles, our habits have uh, meshed together. And Something that's really impressed me this year is I think in your last five games you've lost, you'd follow them all up with wins and actually four game winning streaks if you go back to Boston College. So how has this team been able to respond to losses as well as you have the last couple of months? Yeah, I think we're an older group. So I think um, a lot of us have taken some some lumps uh, in our college careers and we know how to, to bounce back and deal with it and just kind of helping to bring Blake along as well because he's a freshman. But uh, I think we're just mature and know how to bounce back. And uh, we know when we take a loss, like I think we most of the time we've given in our all and we played a, a good game, we just lost that night. So we know just kind of come back, lock into practice and just try to uh, move forward next game. I wanted to ask you about one of the things you just mentioned that was bringing Blake along. You're an older guy. He's of course a young guy that has a ton of talent. Just what do you do? What do the older guys do to try to help him get acclimated to the college level because he looks like he now is acclimated at this yeah, level. Yeah, he's just, I mean, he's, he's very talented and uh, very gifted, so we just try to help him along and, and uh, more so with the mental stuff. I think physically mm -hmm. he has all the tools and um, just me and Prentice especially um, being at the lead guard spot, just try to help him with the, the mental stuff and seeing some different stuff throughout the game to help him with the feel of the game of it, but I mean... He's, he's very gifted. So. I want to ask you about your role. I, I talked to Coach Bray about you a lot because you're a thousand point scorer. You're a very capable scorer, but you're coming off the bench. Sometimes you get more minutes than other games and other times you're asked to really play a big role offensively. How do you stay mentally ready knowing that every night your role might be a little bit different? Yeah, uh, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't hard, mm -hmm. but um, I think it's just trying to just come in every day. Um, I get my work in with Coach Tone and just try to stay mentally and physically ready. And uh, whatever he calls for me to do that night, I'll, I'll try to do my best. I want to go back about two and a half months to the Kentucky game, a game where you played a really big role, of course, maybe the most notable win of this season, one of the best crowds you guys have had in Purcell. What do you remember when you think about the game against Kentucky? Uh, we had just lost to Boston College, and everybody, I think, um, was like, we were, I think, three and four at the time. Everybody's probably like, here we go again, another down season for Notre Dame. And um, that week was an interesting week. We had uh, some rough practices. We had a, a team-only talk where we kind of sat down and just got real with each other. And um, then we came out Saturday. We had the crowd. We were able to play off that. And uh, it was just a really fun day. I mean, anytime you get to beat Kentucky um, and have fans storm the court, I mean, it was just a really, really fun day. You, of course, transferred from Santa Clara. You came from the West Coast out here. I just want to know, when you were making the decision to come to Notre Dame, what were the things that drew you to this place? Well, academically, number one, I think Notre Dame stands out, and that really um, was important to my parents. And then uh, basketball-wise, uh, Coach Bray and the staff really preached to me that they really wanted me. And uh, anytime you really uh, feel wanted, I think that's a, a good place to go. And I think we built a, a great relationship over the process, even though it was a little different with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of stuff over Zoom, I felt we had a, a pretty good relationship and uh, it allowed me to choose another day. You mentioned the academics. I'm just curious, I ask everybody this when they come and talk to me. What's something about Notre Dame away from basketball that you've really appreciated here in your year plus? Uh, I think we kind of take it for granted how big and famous the university is. Mm -hmm. And like there's people from all over coming to visit just to see the buildings we walk the class and see every day. And I think uh, I even take that for granted a little bit, but I think it's, it's just cool kind of just to walk around and kind of go to class every day and say you go to Notre Dame. I think that's not something everybody gets to, gets to say. You guys are in second place, as I mentioned earlier. Three games left, you're only one back of Duke. What's going to be the biggest key for the team here in the last week of the season? Uh, just to control what we control and take care of our business. We can't really control what Duke is going to do. I think um, finishing uh, top two or top three in the conference will be very important, especially to get to the double bye in the ACC tournament. So uh, just kind of focusing on what we can do, and let's see what Duke does. That does it for this week's Irishography. When we come back, we'll look ahead on The Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. 
Coach, you've got three regular season games left, two coming up this week. The first one is Georgia Tech at home, a team you've already beaten this year, but let's be frank, that game came down to the wire in overtime in Atlanta. What's going to be the key against the Yellow Jackets? Well, Gail, you know, I think we'll see a lot of zone again. They match up. It's, it's maybe good that we just had to play 40 minutes against Syracuse's zone because Tech does that. Big and athletic. Uh, can we keep them off the backboard? Not the shooting team, but more the driving team with athletic wings and then going and getting their misses. But it doesn't matter the record of the team coming in here. Like, ACC games, they're going to be hard for us. But we kind of like hard games. In that vein, the following game is at Florida State, a team that's really struggled lately. But, man, they were 6-2 and two earlier this year. Towards the top of the conference, of course, Leonard Hamilton's always going to have them ready. Got to go on the road. Never easy to win on the road. What's the key in that one? Well, we've never won in that building. You know, we have been close. We've played pretty well down there. Prentice and I were talking about it a week ago. We've never won in that facility. Uh, they guard the heck out of us physically. Um, you know, can we rebound the ball there? They have size and athletic ability. Uh, but I want us to be loose on the road and go for it. Coach, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. That does it for this week's Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com.